Um, hi, everyone. I'm Assembly Member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, and thank you so much for joining us for this really important topic tonight. It is such a pleasure to have all of you here to talk about the drought uh, and the importance of conservation and actions that are, we are taking across the state to address the drought. I know it is top of mind for me and my family, and I'm sure that's true for many of you. We are in a drought emergency. There is no two ways about it. 50 out of 58 counties in the state are considered to be in a state of emergency due to the drought conditions and the impacts of that are being felt across the state. The legislature has worked hard this year to invest in long-term water resilience, including $5.2 million in funding for drought response. And that measure will support water and wastewater infrastructure, improve water supply security, and support wildlife and habitat restoration. We know that we have a role to play in ensuring that we are capturing what water we have, as well as keeping our water tables clean so they're accessible and usable to California. But the governor also called on Californians to voluntarily reduce water use by 15% during this time of severe drought this summer. Unfortunately, that goal has not been met. We all need to do more to conserve water and make our communities more water wise. As I said, my family and I are constantly thinking about this. I now wash the dishes at night with no water running, right? So I'm changing my habits. That's what we need to be doing. Um, our guests will touch on programs that exist locally to help accomplish that goal, as well as some helpful tips and tricks. Uh, it's also vital to think about drought in terms of the broader climate crisis. As we take our current steps to use less water and take action in the face of the drought, we also need to think about climate. The root cause cannot be forgotten. It's really important that we focus on what we're doing to make it better, but we cannot forget the underlying issue. As a state, we're investing in our climate and in wildfire resistant resiliency. This year, the state's budget included $2.2 billion for wildfire preparation, obviously critical to the communities that I represent that are on that wildland urban interface. That includes $1.5 billion in funds for forest management, including prescribed burns to lessen the fuel loads, something that we see happening in our community frequently and is really, really important. Today, we'll be focusing on the drought side of the equation. And joining us to share updates on the drought and what is being done locally to help water resiliency are guests from our local water agencies and from the California Department of Water Resources. Representing the California Department of Water Resources is Assistant Deputy Director John Yarbrough. We also have Clifford Chan here from East Bay Municipal Utility D District and Valerie Pryor from Zone 7 Water Agency. And lastly, we have da Dan McIntyre from the Dublin San Ramon Services District. So we have people from all over the district to talk about what we can and should be doing to face the drought that's before us. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today and providing your expertise on these issues. Uh, and as I want to point, I just want to tell everyone who's on live that as we're talking, please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A feature here on the Zoom. We'll do our best to get as many of those questions answered as possible. Although for those of you that have been on our town halls before, you know, we often don't get to them all and I apologize in advance for that. First, we'll hear from John from the Department of Water Resources to get the bigger picture perspective on the drought statewide. So John, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Assemblymember. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone here tonight. So and I wanted to start by uh, the statewide perspective and uh, just, just how dry it is here this year and kind of where we got to this year and then how that leads to our thinking about next year. And I want to talk about from the State Water Project perspective, the statewide perspective, but then that really uh, does affect, um, affects everybody in the state. So it really has that local impact as well. Uh, this or last year was one of our driest years on record when we look at precipitation, particularly up in the northern part of the state. And that northern part of the state is so important, the precipitation there, because that's what really drives a lot of the water supply that's used throughout the state. Uh, dry year last year, and then even drier year this year. When we look at those two years together, it's the second driest two year, uh, two years we've seen since 1977. So you know, very dry conditions. Uh, what was really noteworthy about this year's drought is not just the low precipitation, but how that precipitation, that snowpack turned into runoff. The, uh, that was the smallest translation of snowpack to runoff that we've uh, really have ever seen. And it's that part that's really where we see the effects of a changing climate on this longstanding relationship between how our snowpack would turn into runoff that we could capture in our reservoirs and then make available for use throughout the state. Uh, seeing that long-term relationship break down like it did this year 
getting only 20% of the runoff that we would have expected is really one of these immediate signs that we're seeing that we are uh, dealing with a changing climate here now. So what that led us to do then throughout the year from the State Water Project is taking a lot of actions to conserve our water in the reservoirs. So that's working with the State Water Resource Control Board to change uh, the, the rules for how much water needs to be used to uh, manage salinity in the Delta, uh, installing barrier, barrier in the Delta to help manage salinity, working closely with the, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation as we're jointly operating all of these reservoirs, Shasta, uh, Folsom, Oroville, between the state and federal projects. Um, even with doing those and a number of other actions, what we ended up with this year was some of the lowest reservoir storage that we've ever experienced. So this year, Oroville is the lowest that it's been since that reservoir was filled. And what that means then is we, we move from this year now looking into next year, uh, we're going into next year with really the smallest uh, buffer we have for continued dry conditions having storage in our reservoirs, that gives us some water that we can work with if we have continued dry conditions. Going into next year, we have the, the smallest buffer we've, we've ever had. So when we start looking at next year, what that means is we're, we need to start uh, earlier with our, with our planning and we need to be more aggressive with our planning. So really focusing on uh, these very, you know, what, what could be very uh, worst case scenarios if we have a continued dry winter, dry spring, uh, what are the actions that we're going to need to take? And so getting those um, understood and, and working with our customer agencies, with our partner agencies like the Bureau, to have a list of those actions we can take if we have continued dry years. And so being, you know, being prepared for, for that worst case scenario. And so that means from the state, the state project perspective, the federal project perspective, uh, it means how do we prioritize what, what water we have? And so for us, it really starts with a focus on uh, the term we use is health and safety. So that's making sure water is available for uh, municipal use, for uh, sanitation use, for uh, some of those very uh, critical municipal needs. Um, after that, we're looking at being able to ensure the uh, environmental needs are met. So that's water quality in the Delta. That's uh, very important um, uh, temperature requirements for, for salmon and the Feather River, a, a host of very important environmental requirements. Uh, it's maintaining some some level of reservoir storage for what would happen if we have a dry 2023. And then after that, it's uh, then making what any extra water we have available, uh, available for water supply throughout the state. So that's you know, kind of from the project perspective, we're really, you know, really needing to, to be very aggressive with our planning, uh, have these conversations earlier when we have some more options still that we can take. Um, additionally, from the state perspective, a little beyond just the projects, um, you know, Assembly member also mentioned in the in the state budget the you know, the 5.2 billion dollars there for long term, um, uh, but long term uh, short and long term water resilience, and then of that you know another 815 million for drought relief. So some of that drought relief funding being used for really focusing on areas that have the most immediate needs for for um, for drinking water, so making bulk, uh, bottled water available for those those sort of communities. Um, with a range of other different programs. Uh, you know, governor's asked for everyone to, to start with the 15% conservation. And so you know, I, I had to go fix the sprinklers in my backyard. And, and that's something that you know, there's things that everybody can do at home. And that's, and that's such an important part because that water saved is you know, water that is able to, to be available to the system for where we really have these critical needs. So that conservation, very important for everybody. Um, and we have our, our Save Our Water Dot com website is, is also a great resource to, to look at how each of us at home can uh, do we can to save water. So I wanted to keep that very concise or brief. So uh, thank you very much again for the, the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Sean, for the update. And um, it's, you know, I mean, lifelong California and I grew up here and I remember droughts as a child and, you know, having to conserve. And so it's fascinating to hear that this is really worse than, uh, you know, we've seen in the past. It really puts it in perspective. Um, a question that our office has gotten is about Proposition 1 from 2014, the water bond money. Can you give us a bit of an update on the status of those funds and the projects that are being built? Sure. So, so a little bit of an update. So the Department of Water Resources, we manage about, about $500 million of that, of the total, about $7.5 billion bond. And so through that, through our uh, integrated um, regional water management grant program, I think last year we were able to uh, 
award around 212 million for a variety of different projects that uh, are, are really helping regions interconnect better. Uh, in addition to that, uh, department is also supporting the California Water Commission as they're looking at different longer term storage projects. So like the Los Vizcaros project is one of those examples. So we've been working with them to, um, to look at both the, the, the technical feasibility of those projects, but then also how would those projects integrate with the existing water infrastructure? So that's really been the department's role right now is looking at how those pieces would fit together um, as an important part of moving those projects forward to eventual construction. Awesome. Well, we hope this get built as quickly as possible. They're really critical to the future of water in California. Um, sorry. Oh, I, I said absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we have a role in that, and we will continue to play it. Um, what What do you predict for the upcoming season? Any predictions on whether things are going to get better or? Well, we you know we we don't we don't know what what next year will bring, and it and what we're hoping for is some nice precipitation and some great runoff, but. Um, you know, what we do know is our reservoir is that buffer is, we know it is as, as small as it's ever been. And so while, you know, there's a whole range of uh, what kind of rain we could get, knowing that we have such a small buffer, it's, it's leading us to need to really plan for, um, you know, what will happen if we have continued dry conditions. Yeah, well, thank you for that. It's always good to be prepared for the worst and we'll hope for the best. So um, it was drizzling. I was in LA for a um, a press conference with the governor yesterday. It was drizzling, and I couldn't have been happier. I <laughs> so every bit I got of rain. Sprinkled on this morning, walking into work, and I was very excited. <laughs> right. So we'll all continue to be happy when we feel that precipitation. Um, thank you so much for that update. I'm sure that the questions will come in that may be directed at you. So um, if you can hang around, that would be great. But next, we're going to hear from our local water agencies. Um, we have some questions from community that are applicable to all of our local agencies. So um, we'll have each of them give you an update. And then we can ask some questions and we will try to get to, again, those questions that if you have them, you can put in the Q&A function. Uh, so we'll start with Clifford Chan from East Bay Mud. Clifford, welcome and thanks for being here. Can you give us a general update on East Bay Mud and how you're dealing with the drought and resources for your customers? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Assembly Member, for um, having us at this town hall meeting. And it's great to hear that you've taken action to save water at your house. And I think everybody's doing that. Um, I'll just start just quickly. East Bay Mud provides water service to 1.4 million customers in parts of Alameda and Contra Costa counties. And you heard just, just then from John how dry it's been. Uh, for East Bay Mud, it was the driest year on record in the East Bay and the second driest in our watershed in the, the Sierras. Um, but we all know, you know, we live in an area where droughts are common uh, and we know that climate change will only make it worse. Um, so at East Bay Mud, you know, we've spent decades planning and implementing programs to ensure water supply reliability during extended droughts. Um, and that was part of our long-term water supply plan. plan. Um, so this year, um, while our water supply situation isn't great, um, it's also not terrible because of all that planning that we've done. Um, so I do wanna to talk to you a bit about what we're doing here at East Bay Mud and how we can help you as well. Um, so our plan includes using recycled water. Um, in fact, uh, we use 9 million gallons of recycled water each day. Another big part of our plan is water conservation. Um, since the 1970s, our customers have reduced their water use by 46 million gallons per day. Um, you know, in fact, you know, we use less water today than we did in the 1970s, even though our service area has grown by more than 300,000 people. Another key element of our plan is our Freeport facility that lets us take water from the Sacramento River uh, in dry years. Um, we invested over a half a billion dollars in these facilities specifically to improve our drought resilience. Um, just a few days ago, on Monday actually, we started that facility and we're bringing in 11 billion gallons of water or about 20% of our customers' water needs for a year. Um, and also to help us this year, and you heard the assembly member talk about it, we're also asking our customers to voluntarily reduce their water use um, by 10%. Um, we have lots of programs to help our customers save water um, to help us achieve that 10% goal. Now, our program and our outreach campaign is based on three themes, um, and those are irrigate efficiently, find and fix leaks, and be mindful of indoor use. And I'll share some of those tips and resources with you tonight, um, but I just wanna assure you, you can find everything on our website. Um, so the first tip, um, you know, we're in the fall, we're heading into winter. Uh, now is the time to adjust your irrigation timers 
Uh, plants need a lot less water now than they did in the summertime. Um, our website has lots of information and tips on how to use water efficiently, especially outdoors. Um, it's also a good time to look for leaks on your irrigation system. Uh, irrigation leaks are very common. Uh, another common uh, leak is with toilets. And so we offer a free home survey kit um, to help you find those leaks. Um, uh, and if you see a leak in your neighborhood or if you see someone wasting water, you can also report them on our website. We have a link to report water waste and we will work with those customers. Um, we also offer rebates and free water saving devices. Um, some of those free water saving devices include shower heads. We have rebates to replace your lawn up to $1.50 per square foot. Um, we offer rebates for flow meters. So that'll let you monitor your water usage near real time on your phone. And we have rebates for smart irrigation meters. Um, we've partnered with Pandora. This was something that was really clever. We partnered with Pandora to share five minute songs from local musicians that you can time your shower to. Um, now to put this in perspective of how much water we can save, if everyone in East Bay Mud Service Area cut one minute off of their shower, that would save 2 million gallons per day. That's huge. Um, we also hold webinars for anyone to participate on topics related to water conservation. Uh, the next one is on October 14th about how to efficiently water trees. Um, we do find that people overwater their trees. We have virtual office hours. Now, if you, you know, think back to your college days of office hours, we have virtual office hours for customers to ask questions about how they can save water. Um, we just had one yesterday and today um, in English and in Spanish um, on leak detection tips and resources. Um, we have a Water Wednesday speaker series. Uh, it's on the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, this month on October 20th, we're talking about water quality. Uh, and in November, the talk is about drought myth busters, uh, where we're going to talk about recycled water and desalination. All this information, again, is on our website. Um, and while you're on our website, log into your account and check that your contact information is correct. Um, and we want you to do that so we can send you emails about all of these events and activities that we have. And you can also sign up for home water reports and leak reports where we'll let you know how much water you use and compare it to um, your neighbors and your neighborhood. Um, and also we'll let you know if we detect a leak at your home. Finally, um, you know, we love to talk about conservation. Um, if you're part of an organization or a community group, email us at waterconservation at evmud.com and we can meet with your group to do a presentation. Um, and you can also use that same email address and email us if you have questions about how you can save water. Um, and finally, I just want to thank the assembly member for having us at this town hall meeting. And I just want to end by saying, you know, we are in this drought together and we'll make it through this drought together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clifford. And I have to say, I got two tips from that. I'm going to get my home survey kit and I'm definitely playing those songs while my kids shower. <laughs> Maybe it'll motivate them to take shorter showers. That is the problem in our household. Um, so next up, we have uh, Valerie Pryor from Zone 7 Water Agency. Valerie, can you start by just giving our audience, I know it's so confusing probably to people on here, all these different water agencies and who they support. So can you give us a little bit of context about Zone 7 and the role you play in the Tri-Valley's water systems? Yes, and thank you, Assembly Member, for, for having this uh, meeting and for inviting me. So Zone 7, we are the wholesale water agency that serves the uh, Dublin San Ramon Services District, Livermore, Cal Water and Livermore, and Pleasanton. Uh, so we serve the, the cities of Dublin, Livermore and Pleasanton, and then we serve the Doherty Valley portion of San Ramon through a contract with DSRSD. Um, in addition to being the wholesaler to those retail agencies, we also serve about 15% of our water supplies or direct sales to agriculture. So next slide, please. I don't know who's controlling the slides. <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. So as I mentioned, we, we are the wholesaler. So for the most part, people at their houses or in their businesses, they do not receive the water from zone seven. They, they receive it from one of the retail water agencies. And the reason I'm showing you the slide is to understand where your water comes from and how this drought is particularly impacting zone seven's water supplies. So in our community, about 70% of our water is imported through the state water project. Um, about 11% is recycled water provided by the retailers. About um, the, the rest is either a local water right or local groundwater. 
but 70% of our water comes from the state water project. And as you've heard from John Yarbrough earlier, those, those supplies are very limited this year and we're concerned about next year. So this graphic shows, you know, state water project starts at Sierra Nevada snow melt. It comes through the Delta and it comes through the South Bay aqueduct. And then at zone seven, um, we store some of it in Lake Del Val, and then we treat water at our two major surface water treatment plants, Patterson Pass and Del Val. Um, and some of it we send through our groundwater demineralization plant. Some of it we store in our local groundwater basin, and then we later pump it from wells. And that's the water then that then goes to homes and businesses through the retailers. Next slide, please. Okay, well, I can... I can, go without the slides. The <laughs> I can go without the slides, that's fine. So, um, you know, water supplies are quite low. And so um, we have been at zone seven, we've been messaging voluntary conservation. Okay, if we can get to the next slide. So our water supplies are low and we do need conservation. So we, we began messaging voluntary conservation in May with 10% voluntary conservation. And then um, after the governor uh, executive order was for 15%. We started messaging 15% voluntary conservation. We did that in, in collaboration with the retailers. Um, and also like to point out, this is our drought alert uh, dashboard that we're just now rolling out probably today or tomorrow. So this is hot off the press. Um, but our Tri-Valley rainfall shortage is low. That's our local water. And for the Livermore Valley, we just ended the water year and it was our lowest on recorded history. So we went lower than the 76, 77 um, drought. So that's not good for our local water supplies. And then again, the drought alert showing Lake Oroville is at 23% of capacity. And then we have our drought alert showing how we're doing on conservation. So we've requested 15% conservation and we just got our September numbers and it was only 3%. So we are falling short of voluntary conservation. So based on this, the Zone 7 Board of Directors on September 1st declared a local drought emergency and is requesting mandatory or requiring mandatory conservation 15% from the retailers. And the retailers are implementing their own programs. I'm sure Dan McIntyre can tell you a little bit about that. So next slide, please. And the reason conservation is so important is because there will be times during the next year where we may be very dependent on just local water only. 70% of our supplies might not be available. So we really want to be able to conserve the groundwater we have stored in our local basin for as long as possible. And this slide shows typical water use in, in our area. And what I really wanna highlight is that 60% of water use typically is outdoor watering, outdoor irrigation. So this is really where we want to focus our um, conservation efforts. So next slide, please. So here are some tips on how you can help protect our water supply. Cut down on outdoor water usage. Get tips from Wizard Waterwise Windy at zone7water.com waterwise. So we've started Waterwise Windy as an educational campaign to provide easy to do tips. Try implementing a new Waterwise tip each week. Tell your friends and neighbors, get your kids involved. Follow us on Facebook for news, tips, and rebate information, and take advantage of newly increased rebate amounts. And one thing I want to mention here is there are people that are water conservation experts. And if you're one of those experts, we thank you for that. And we want you to know this 15% target is not aimed at you. So we want the people that aren't as efficient as you to do some of the things that you've done, reduce their outdoor irrigation, fix their leaks, follow these tips. So we are not asking our water conservation experts to conserve an additional 15%, but we'd really like you to share your expertise and share these tips with your neighbors and friends so we can all get there together. And as far as uh, the rebate amounts, the last item on that slide is the Zone 7 Board of Directors voted to significantly increase our lawn conversion rebates and our high, efficient, high efficiency washing machine rebates. So we really encourage you to go to our website and learn more about conservation. And I believe that was my last slide. So thank you very much. Thank you. I can't believe 60% for outdoor watering. I mean, that's a, a shocking number. So there's a great way to cut some significant water usage just by cutting down the time that you watch, you water your grass. Um, thank you.
Valerie, for that helpful information. And I think there were a lot of good tips in there. Um, and last but not least, we have Dan McIntyre from the Dublin San Ramon Services District. Dan, I know DSRSD, I think I got that right, does some cool work on water recycling, which is really important. So can you share more about that and provide a drought update from your perspective? Yeah, so Dublin San Ramon Services District obviously serves uh, Dublin, and for water, uh, we serve uh, the Jordy Valley of San Ramon. Uh, and I wanted to thank uh, you, Assemblymember Bauer Kane, for inviting uh, DSRSD to your town hall so we could uh, share some thoughts about uh, the drought and conserving uh, water. So, DSRSD is unique. We're a water recycled and wastewater uh, treatment agency. And uh, actually, back in the late 90s, we partnered with East Bay Mud to create a joint recycled water uh, program to serve the San Ramon Valley. So that's kind of uh, Dublin, San Ramon, and ultimately up into uh, Danville. And we've been expanding that program over a number of 20 years. Uh, the wastewater that we recycle to use for irrigation of uh, medians, and sports parks, and, uh, and other public landscaped areas comes from our wastewater treatment plant that's actually in Pleasanton. And our program is very successful. So over the course of a whole year, we actually recycle 40% of the wastewater that comes into the plant. And uh, actually in the peak period in the summer, we're recycling every single drop that comes into the plant. And that wastewater is treated as, as recycled water uh, serving Dublin, uh, San Ramon, and now also Pleasanton uh, more recently. Uh, DSRSD is one of the four retailers that, that Valerie is mentioning that uh, receives water from zone seven and we distribute potable water. Uh, so how does recycling fit into DSRSD's program? Uh, it's a very big program for us since we're a small agency. Actually of all the water that we provide uh, to, to our customers, 25% of that in the course of a year is actually recycled water. So in a sense, we're already conserving 25% drinking water because we're recy recycling the water as part of our partnership with East Bay Mud and we're very proud of our San Ramon Valley Recycled Water uh, Program. So on uh, conservation uh, in the Tri-Valley, uh, along with Zone 7 and the other retailers, we called for 10% voluntary conservation earlier in the year. We escalated that to 15% uh, voluntary conservation, uh, but we haven't yet hit the mark. So all of the water agencies in the Tri-Valley are going forward now with mandatory conservation. DSRSD a couple of weeks ago implemented mandatory stage two conservation. It's required 15% conservation. And the main uh, technique that, that will help us achieve that goal is limiting irrigation. So our regulations in our service area now limit uh, irrigation to three days a week. Uh, and limiting irrigation is the most critical uh, step uh, on conserving water. Uh, one program that I want to share with you, uh, and it touches on, on some of the themes that Clifford had hit, was uh, monitoring uh, water usage, primarily looking at uh, breaks in your irrigation system or stuck valves uh, and, and other uh, broken sprinkler heads is a big thing. And it's real easy if you don't notice, if you have one of those problems, to lose 5, 10, 15,000 gallons of water a month and not even know it until the bill shows up. So we did a number of years ago is actually uh, implemented our automated uh, meter infrastructure program. And we actually tied it to computer software called AquaHawk. And our customers can sign up through our webpage and that's dsrsd.com. And then you can tie into our AquaHawk software. So that's AquaHawk, you know, like it sounds all one word. Um, and you can monitor your water usage. And the cool thing is, we're electronically monitoring and reading the water meters every hour. And our database in AquaHawk is posting the information immediately. And so you can actually watch hour to hour how much uh, water you're using. And you can go in with this software and you can actually set uh, criteria when you want to be notified, when you want to get a text or an email if your water use exceeds a certain amount. So if you use that to its full capacity, you can catch a water leak in your irrigation system in an hour, you know, you could be sitting at work and, uh, and get an alarm that, oh, the sprinkler system uh, broke and you can call your contractor to come out and make your uh, repairs. So that's a, a real important feature. Uh, more than half of our customers at DSRSD use the AquaHawk system. And again, you can go to dsrsd.com and sign up for that. It's easy to use and you can track it with your iPhone or Android device 
and be all over leaks in a hurry. I love that. I got it. Clever, you're going to have to tell me if I'm an East Bay Mud customer, whether I have access to that. Um, <laughs> but that is, I also think that, you know, as I've been able to do that with my electricity, it's affected my habits. Because I can, when I watch in real time, you start to realize, right, how much usage uh, there is for given activity and you can change your behavior accordingly. So, um, that is really interesting. I love that. And um, all of you, so all of you pointed out, I think, maybe not all of you, that we are not hitting our 15% reduction goals that we really need to be shooting for. Um, I think Valerie had a 3% number in her slideshow. So really far from that 15% goal. So we need to do more. I think that's clear. We've heard that, I think we've heard that irrigation is probably the biggest impact and paying attention to those leaks. Does each of you sort of have the hottest tip for what our, um, folks who are watching should do to cut back to get to that 15%? And I'll add to that question. Somebody actually asked in the questions, is it 15% less than last year? Or what is that 15% a comparison of? I think that's a good question. Clifford, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Um, so first, you know, our, our goal at East Bay Mud is 10% voluntary, not 15%. And I think an important thing to just remember is, you know, the state is not homogeneous. Every utility is at a different place in their water supplies, and, and we set 10%. Our customers are doing a great job. We're at 8%. Um, so we're pretty close to the target that we set. I think the other important thing to remember is it's not 10% every month of the year. You know, we expect more savings in the summer because you can give more and then less uh, in the wintertime. But it's an average over the entire year that we're looking at you know, 10%. So if in the wintertime you hear or our customers are only saving 7%, um, you know, we shouldn't be alarmed because that's, they can't give as much in the winter time because a lot of the outdoor irrigation is gone. Our baseline at East Bay Mud is last year. So when we make the comparison, it's last year. That's the same that the state brought out. They're comparing everything to last year. Um, and that's, so that's what we're doing too. Um, very easy things that you can do. Again, if, you know, uh, the outdoor irrigation is the absolute easiest thing that you can do. Um, you know, I, I make sure that we water like my house and my garden, which is relatively small, very efficiently um, because plants, you know, need, you know, deep soaking and not the frequent watering. That's the easiest way. Other things you can do, you know, full loads of, of uh, dishes, full loads of laundry. Um, you know, back in the 70s, 76, 77, you might remember the, you know, when it's brown, flush it down, when it's yellow, let it mellow. Um, not a bad thing this year too. You know. Very small things that you can do can save a lot of water. Um, and I can't emphasize enough, you know, a minute or two off of that shower makes a huge difference. You know, shower heads are about two to two and a half gallons per minute. Um, so it doesn't take much to reduce your water use. Yeah, with five people taking showers in my house, if I got everyone down a minute, that's a lot of water. <laughs> um, so, I know, Dan, you mentioned that um, DSRSD has asked folks to only irrigate three days a week. Is that right? I heard that right. So, and Livermore, I know, has also set um, limitations on when they'd like people to irrigate. Is that standard now that there's sort of irrigation requests across communities? Yeah, in the Tri Valley, uh, all of the retailers have gone to three days a week since we're all under a common uh, regime. And we see with our warmer temperatures out here in the Tri Valley, uh, that's the best way to hit the mark. So we're all uh, implementing uh, a common standard with our different plans. Got it. And then, okay, so I loved Aquahawk. I love how we use technology to impact us and our behavior. Can you talk about, I mean, this, I think, as I spoke about at the beginning, climate is changing and drought, you know, could be something we face more frequently moving forward. Although we just heard yesterday, that some of the predictions are that in the long term, we might see more water, but I guess we've been surprised by how the climate crisis has impacted us thus far. I can imagine that will be true moving forward as well. Um, but do you think there's any, what other promising technologies do we have on the horizon to help deal with this issue? We've gotten a lot of questions in the chat about desalination. So I don't know if John, you wanna weigh in on that. Is desalination a part of our future? What are we looking at? How are we gonna address this in the future? Yeah, I could say, uh... I guess from the statewide perspective, would see see desalinization as as part of the puzzle, and that it really, as you look local area by local area, um, you know, as was just said, each region is different, and so um, you know in some places we're you know very 
far down in the state, San Diego or on the coast, which is far from some of the other projects that, you know, things like desalinization can make a lot of sense. So I'd say that that's an important part of a, of a whole picture. The other parts are our, you know, conveyance systems, it's groundwater, it's uh, surface storage, it's really you need all these parts working together. Um, you can't just pick one area, you need the whole, the whole system to work together. Yeah, anyone else have any technologies they think are coming that'll help this problem? Clifford, I see you unmuting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like John's answer as far as desalination. You know, I think the things that we're looking at, um, I, you know, there's more recycled water. I shared that we're doing 9 million gallons per day. Our goal is to get to 20 million gallons per day. Um, I think other things that we're doing is um, groundwater. You know, we're looking at in wet years, you know, let's put some of that water in the ground so that in dry years that we can take it out. So we're working in San Joaquin County to look at banking some groundwater. And that's, the, that's kind of the good things that we're doing to, you know, get some more water. I, I would say there's some other cool things that we're doing here at East Bay Mud, just to make sure that, you know, our pipes ourselves aren't leaking uh, throughout the system. So we're using satellites to help find leaks underground. And we're putting devices on our pipes to listen for leaks in our own system, because just as we ask our customers to save water, we wanna make sure that we're careful about the water that we're saving. We still have main breaks, those happen, um, they're unavoidable, but we've done a lot of work to minimize how many of those are, and find those in advance. A lot of really cool technology uh, on that front as well. Valerie, what do you have to add? I might add for zone seven, we are considering a number of water supply and water supply reliability projects. Um, the Los Vicaros Reservoir expansion project, the Sites Reservoir, the Delta Conveyance Project, Potable Reuse, and Bay Area Regional Desalination. Um, these are all in the, the planning stages. Final decisions have not been made, but the agency is actively participating in these projects. And, and we know that we will need one or more of these projects for future water supply reliability. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And we've gotten some questions on um, the, you know, reuse, right, recycling, which we heard a little bit about from Dan, which is obviously a part of this puzzle. And, um, you know, the other doing all the things that are necessary. I know in Pleasanton, the city had to shut down some of their wells due to the PFAS issues, right, making sure we have the technology to clean the the water that we have access to so that it's accessible and usable. All of it has to go into this calculation. So I appreciate that. Um, lastly, can we talk for one second, my last, my questions, and then we'll get to more of the audience questions, I should say. Um, rates, how does this all affect the drought and these conservation efforts affect customers' rates? Um, and what should we expect to see coming down the pipe? Dan, you want to start as the retailer? Sure. Uh, just this uh, week. So one of the things we wanted to do is to send a price signal uh, to our customers, provide an economic incentive uh, to conserve water. So we went to uh, stage two emergency conservation rates. And what that's going to mean is, uh, you know, for a typical customer, their water bill on average will go up four or five dollars uh, a month if they don't conserve. So the whole point is, you can serve, you can get your price, you know, what you're paying in your bill uh, back to normal. So we're kind of putting that out as a first step for this 15% level of conservation. And that will start in November in our service area. Clifford, what's happening in the East Bay Mun territory? Yeah, I'll speak to it in terms of both short-term and long-term. You know, we're still voluntary rationing. So um, there's no um, additional changes to our, our water costs. So in fact, you know, if you start using less water, your bill is going to go down. Um, if we do go to mandatory rationing, you know, similar to Dan, you know, we're going to put some surcharges, um, uh, you know, because we're purchasing all those supplemental supplies, and you'll see, you know, an increase similar to what Dan is talking about for our customers as well. For the long term, you know, as we talk about these resiliency projects, more recycled water, more groundwater, um, and even potentially, you know, desalination. Those are expensive projects. Um, it's expensive to treat, it's expensive to build. These are things that we're gonna have to think about of, you know, we don't know what those costs will be to our customers, but as we think about resiliency, um, there will be a cost associated with it. Yeah, and I think that goes back to one of the questions I asked earlier, which is obviously the water bond money, which should be going to some of um, that, as well as investments the state is making, providing clean, accessible water is obviously critical to the work we do, and we need to continue to, 
to support it uh, moving forward with all of the investments um, that we've mentioned today, especially those that give such an incredible return. Um, so uh, Mike asked a really good question that I like. So he said, um, are there resources available for homeowners who would like to convert current lawns um, to more drought tolerant or native design? And um, both uh, the question I think relates to both, are there um, programs to get resources for that, but also to learn about it, right? He, he really referenced, how do I learn what my options are if I want to be more drought tolerant? I, I can take that one first. <laughs> well, first, we, we offer money to replace your lawn. We have a lot of resources on our website. There's actually a very cool, um, uh, uh, one of our pages where you can see a house with a lawn and you can slide across and you can see what it'll look like when you go to a drought tolerant garden. We also have a book um, that we offer on how to plant in, in these types of dry climates. Um, and you can call us and we will point you to other resources. So lots of resources on our website, our employees are happy to help out. And we also offer financial incentives to replace your lawn. Awesome, oh, I like that design tool. Uh, Valerie, did you have anything to add? Similar for Zone 7, um, we do offer rebates. They were significantly increased this year for lawn conversion. And I did in the chat post a link to our website, which has more information on the rebates in the program. Great. So yes, yeah, so they're both resources for how to do it, what it'll look like, and money. That's fun. Um, but it is, as we've heard, the irrigation is so big that that really is a huge thing that each of us can think about doing. Um, housing and growth there's been a multiple questions in the q a about you know we talk about increasing access to housing in the bay area specifically because we have so many jobs and we don't have the housing to meet that demand um, but how does that interact with this crowd and with access to water and can you guys talk about how you're planning to make sure that as our housing stock increases we have the water to meet that need valerie you want to start i can start um first of all i just like to point out that the droughts are short term and they differ from long term water supply reliability. So, you know, at zone seven, we have a program to store excess water in wet years and take that out in dry years. And that works most of the time. It's only in times of extreme drought that we need to ask for, you know, more conservation. As far as land use, uh, zone seven, we are a water agency. We are not a land use planning agency. So the cities and the counties make all the decisions on land use planning. Um, and, and our mission is to you know, provide water to support those needs. We do have an urban water management plan. We just uh, adopted our new 2020 urban water management plan a few months ago. Um, it is based on the cities and the counties housing and other growth numbers. And we are showing that we do have sufficient water supplies to support that. That's great. Clifford, anything to add? Yeah, I'll just, I, I won't repeat anything Valerie talked about, but you know, what we do when we look at our water supply, we look at how much water we have and what that demand is going to be. And that demand is based, we meet with every, you know, East Bay Mud has 20 cities and uh, incorporated and 15 unincorporated cities. We meet with all the cities and counties and look at their plans and project out to 2040 and 2050 to see what those demands will be and make sure that we have enough water to meet those demands. And we do, um, of course, in dry years, you know, there might be some customer rationing. But we do have enough water and we base it on, you know, what they tell us the, the build out will be in the future. Got it. So that's important work. Um, John, I think this one's for you from Chris. Can you talk about what is being done to expand the water supply system, both in terms of building more dams and raising existing dams? I think you touched on that briefly, but he was hoping you would expand out on that more specifically. Sure. So there's a, a I think Valerie just mentioned, so there's a handful like Los Vizqueros, a handful of different supply projects that right now have said, um, you know, departments working with those projects to figure out how they'd integrate into the system. Um, one of the important projects, the uh, Delta Conveyance Project is one the department's seen as a, a very important part of um, that conveyance infrastructure, helping linking reservoirs in the north, storage in the south. Um, being able to move that water around the system really gives a lot of flexibility for years like this. Um, what we were able to do in 2018, 19, when we had those wet years, moving water south into, into storage reservoirs like uh, San Luis, that, that's really the water that we've been able to use in 2020, 2021 to meet those needs down in, in the valley. So having that conveyance ability to move water around 
um, we really see the benefits of having done that in, in years like this. So ensuring those systems are robust is really you know, one of the important areas that, that we're focusing on. So, so again, there's some you know, new storage projects like, like Los Vizqueros is one that we're looking at, a uh, conveyance, uh, linking our groundwater infrastructure to our surface water through conveyances, another area that we're looking to get you know, additional, additional storage, additional flexibility in the system. And I'd say the last, the, last part, the last part is, you know, these are aging systems too. And so that's another, um, you know, in addition to looking for new resources, it's been so critical to look at the existing resources and make sure that we're uh, continuing to invest in those to make sure that the you know, the seismic needs, the uh, just the the long term sustainability of our existing resources uh, that we're we're investing there because we need those everything functioning to keep getting the benefits that we've been enjoying so far. Yeah, um, thank you. And one additional question for you was about um, whether state funding is going to um, potable reuse filtration systems. Is that something that we're investing in at the state level? Do you know? I don't know. That's an excellent question. <laughs> And unfortunately, that's not one that I would I know the answer to off the top of my head. So that'd be a good one for uh, for me to talk with my colleagues, and then maybe we can email you on the side, and you can can get an answer. I'd be I now I'm interested to find out. Yeah, no, and we we should look into that too. It's obviously an important part of how we uh, get access to water. Um, so here's a, another one from Joan touching on this question of people doing their own work at home to convert to be more water wise. So Joan asked, um, is there help with uh, household rainwater storage? So I know actually one of my neighbors just put a system in that captures rainwater for irrigation um, and also for gray water retrofit. So if people want to make those changes to better use water. Is there um, assistance out there for that? Valerie, you want to? Those are not programs Zone 7 is currently involved in. Okay. Clifford, anything on that? Yeah, we, we do offer information and some small rebates on gray water systems um, if you want to convert. Um, you know, the rain barrels, you know, the reality is, you know, we're focusing on projects that have larger regional benefits for East Bay mud. You know, rain barrels, I think, are nice for customers, but the reality is um, uh, in our type of climate, uh, a rain barrel doesn't offer um, as much benefit as people think. You know, it's much better in the Midwest. You know, it, we have a very distinct dry period and a very distinct wet period, and you can only store so much water to make a, a big enough difference. And we're focusing on the larger projects that have bigger benefit. But Got we can certainly point people to resources if they're interested in doing rain barrels. Awesome. Interesting. Um, but it sounds like there is some money for gray water retrofits. And that there is, we have some rebates for that. Okay, so that is that information on your website? It's uh, right on our website and the link that was uh, posted. Perfect. Okay, so we can follow up there. Um, oh, here's a question, and I'll turn this one to Dan. Um, is recycled water being made available to residential customers? So you talked about your recycled water program. Is that going to con consumers? Uh, so for residential uh, customers, what we're looking at next year is a uh, potential joint project between DSRSD, Pleasanton, and Livermore, where through some complicated plumbing arrangements, Livermore is going to provide uh, the wastewater to feed this program. And we'd operate a joint facility in Dublin. There would be shared staffing. Um, so that's something we might be able to get uh, up and running by June of next year. We have some physical improvements we have to make uh, to implement that and to work out uh, some details. If there's mandatory conservation next year, we expect to have that facility in place. We had a program a few years ago, some of you may remember, and uh, there were about uh, maybe 3,000 customers who, you know, a couple times a week would come in and pick up uh, water for irrigation. So um, if there's mandatory conservation, we hope to have a joint uh, facility in operation in Dublin uh, next June. Exciting news. Um, John, this one's for you uh, from Dex. According to the Department of Water Resources, 80% of the water use um, in California is for agricultural uses. What's being done to conserve a ration on the agriculture side? Do you know what we're doing statewide to ensure that our agricultural consumers are doing the best they can? Yeah, so there's there's a handful of different things. So within the agricultural industry, there you know there is a lot of work being done to ensure that water is being used efficiently there. Uh, as we look the next year, um, 
you know, if we have these continued dry conditions, the water supply through the water, the state water project uh, is really gonna be focused first on these municipal health and safety needs it's through this prioritization. It's then environmental needs, minimal storage. And then it's only after that would, would water supply be made available really for, for agricultural uses. So um, agriculture really then is, is looking at using um, water that they've stored in different systems. It's using um, some sustainable degree of groundwater pumping. So you know, using other water in the system to meet their needs. So um, it's an important use of water in the state. It, it, the agriculture industry is doing a lot to be very, um, you know, being, being very water wise in their own use of water. Um, and then they're having to have a, a variety of sources for times like this when they're not gonna get um, as much state project supply. Yeah, thank you for that. I know we, I moved to Bell my first year in the legislature. Um, that would have been a grant program for drip irrigation on farms because there's ways for them to be water wise as well. And we really wanted to support that move as we need to conserve water um, and we're continuing to work on that. Um, this is an interesting question. And um, so this to the programs that we heard um, both you, Valerie and Clifford talk about um, for rebates, so for the yards and the gray water, somebody asked, are those available to homeowner associations? So if you live in a multi-unit building with a homeowner association and you wanna make those changes, are they available to those customers? Yes, so, okay. our, our rebate programs are for single family homes and for multi-family homes. Great, and same for you, Clifford? Uh, same for the lawn conversion and, and others. They're actually, the dollar amounts can be even bigger and you know, if you have a nice, I, I would also say, if you have a nice outdoor area that's very publicly accessible, um, we also provide money to do demonstration gardens. So if, if, if there, you have a high you know, foot traffic areas that people can see how you can save water, um, we do offer um, uh, funding for that. Mm, that's fun. Um, okay, good to know. So for any of you that are on your homeowner association, um, okay. Probably our last question, just time-wise, but a really important question from Beth Clark, who has um, said that she's been reducing water usage and being water-wise for many years. She long ago removed her lawn and did the turnover to a drought-resistant uh, garden, and yet she is also subject to the 15% reduction, which is very hard for her because her water usage right now is very low. So she's asking, are there any caveats for those who are already um, using little water to that 15% reduction? I'll, I'll jump in first, um, just quickly, because this question comes up a lot. And, you know, keep in mind, you know, East Bay Mines at 10%, you know, and if we go to 15% or whatever number, that's what we're trying to achieve for our entire system, not necessarily individuals. And so I would say to her, if you're already saving a lot of water, keep it up. Great job. You don't need to do any more. If you're using more water, those are the people that we want you to save water. So when we, when we say the 10%, it can be very confusing that you think I'm already using 10 gallons of water per day. What else do you want me to do? What we want you to do is keep up the great work. It's for the people who are using a lot of water that can give because that percentage we're talking about is for our entire system, not individually. So I would say, uh, I forgot her name, but <laughs> fantastic job. Yes. I'm so <laughs> proud, Beth, I'm proud of you for everything you've done. Great job. Yeah, and all that water the best saved over the years was stored for now. So we appreciate it, Beth. Um, Valerie, anything to add? I would say the same thing as, as Clifford. It's, it's a regional target. Um, and thank you, Beth, for saving and share your tips with friends and, and neighbors. Yeah, Dan, anything to add? I saw you. Uh, amen. Yes, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a community goal that we need to hit. And it's much appreciated those that, uh, you know, for a number of years, especially since the last drought, have kept up the good behavior all along. And I'm sure there'll be other people uh, who are going to step up this time and exceed the target. And I think we, you know, we're gonna be able to hit our targets collectively. Awesome, well, thank you. With that, okay, one more question. Because these are such good questions and I love how engaged everyone is on drought resiliency. Um, so last question, so we just heard about Beth who lives in Northern California who's doing an incredible job of saving water. And Leslie asked about, um, you know, she said, you know, John, you spoke about the connection between Northern California water and Southern California water, which all of us Californians very much understand. Um, can you talk about sort of what is statewide happening so that we know that Southern California is also mitigating their usage um, so that we're all in this together? 
Yeah, so we're you know started with voluntary that was statewide. The governor asking everybody throughout the state to conserve, and you know as we look forward um, into next year, you know if if things continue to get dry, it is that that statewide look of uh, you know would have more more stringent requirements to conserve, and that is um, you know as we're looking forward to next year, you know, would see that having potential statewide effects. Uh, you know each region is different and. Uh, Southern California has some water that they had stored during wet years like 1819 that they've been using. But uh, as they're planning for next year, you know, they're looking at a very similar situation of really having um, uh, very stressed supplies and are, are having their own needs to, to conserve. Um, it really is needing to look at this as a whole state because um, you know this water, it, it, you know, it's a whole state issue and really need to look at it as a big system there. So it's something where all of us need to be doing our part uh, to make sure we get to manage through this drought. Yeah, thank you, John. And I know, so, I mean, that, thank you so much. And I, you know, I am so proud of how we here in 8016 um, come together to take care of our community in every way, um, but also de dealing with um, the drought and doing our part to be water wise and save water when we need to, which is right now. So um, you heard from a lot of our water agencies about incredible resources. So, and we put in the chat um, those websites. So please get connected to your local water agency, become an aqua hawk, I love that. Um, and let's start conserving more water and um, sharing what you learn with others. I think that was such a good tip. I think we listen to our friends and family. So the more we can share what we've learned here today and what we're each doing, the better off we are. Uh, I know we weren't able to answer all of your questions. So if you weren't, your questions weren't answered and you want to follow up, please do so. You can reach my office at 925-244-1600 and we will answer your question um, or do our best to find out who can answer your question. And we just put that number in the chat. So again, thank you all for joining us for everything you're doing to help us get through this drought and everything you do every day to provide clean water to each of our families. It really is life sustaining. And so your work is so important. And I want to thank each and every one of you for the work you do on that. Um, and thank you everyone who came, who was engaging in this issue. It's so important. Um, we're hosting another virtual town hall, which I will tell you about uh, next week on wildfire prevention and planning. And we'll be discussing uh, mitigation uh, as well as emergency preparedness. How can you be prepared um, for wildfires and the season that is before us is something that is top of mind for me, both for my family and for all of you as my constituents. We wanted to provide those resources. That is October 12th at 1 p.m. You can find more information and register for the event at my website, a16.asmdc.org. And thank you everyone for being here.